Welcome to Heritage Mississauga's Black Heritage Matters webinar series. This is the fourth of our four-part series during Black History Month. Special thanks to our funders, the Community Foundation of Mississauga, Hazel McCallion Fund for the Arts, Culture and Heritage, and the City of Mississauga. We'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the land on which we meet today is part of the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We recognize the importance of this land and pay our respects to the Anishinaabe and other First Nations peoples, Métis and Inuit, past, present, and future. For our fourth webinar in our Black Heritage Matter series, we are very pleased to welcome Dr. Brian Walls from the John Freeman Walls Historic Site and Underground Railway Museum. Dr. Brian Walls is a recipient of the Order of Canada and the Order of Ontario, Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal, and the Ontario Black History Society's Matthew DaCosta Award. He is a past president of the Ontario Historical Society, past board member of the Ontario Heritage Trust, and founder and owner of the John Freeman Walls Historic Site and Underground Rail Railroad Museum in Lakeshore, Ontario, just outside of Windsor. Dr. Walls is a noted historian and lecturer on multiculturalism and diversity training. He's a president of Proverbs Heritage Organization, which is a federally registered charity, charitable not-for-profit organization. He's a visiting and adjunct professor in the College of Education at Niagara University, where he focuses on teaching multiculturalism and diversity to future teachers. And perhaps my favorite of all, Dr. Walls has a personal motto of never, never, never give up. His presentation today is entitled, The Road That Led to Somewhere, and we'll explore the deeper significance of his book and tell the story of his ancestors, and their journey on the Underground Railroad from enslavement to freedom in Canada. You can visit the website for the John Freeman Walls uh, Historic Site and Underground Railroad Museum at www.undergroundrailroadmuseum.org and also available through the, through the website is his book, The Road That Led to Somewhere. And thank you so very much, Dr. Walls, for joining us here today and uh, I turn it over to you. Now, thank you very much, Matthew, and uh, uh, we crystallized a friendship over the last few weeks, and, and that, that in itself is a, is a blessing. Uh, I, I'm certainly happy to, uh, uh, to and honored uh, to be, uh, be chosen to, to share my, my, my thoughts, my humble thoughts, uh, yet with great pride as a, a proud Canadian. Uh, the, the, or, the motto of the Order of, of Canada is there's a Durante's Melorium Patrium, we desire a better country. And I can't think of any better way to, uh, uh, to radiate out that message than to talk about uh, uh, history. And more specifically, uh, the passion that I and, and other members of my family and church family have to preserve, protect and promote uh, unique uh, family history uh, in the as an American missionary uh, minister uh, by the name of George Whipple uh, said way back in the in the 1860s, uh, this is a peculiar family story, and uh, I, I will uh, try to encapsulate in the in the short time that I, I have with you uh, the uh, the essence of uh, uh, of the deeper significance of what the Underground Railroad. Uh, not only means to to me as a direct descendant, but also uh, to other uh, Canadians. Uh, I have uh, also the the desire in my in my words this uh, this afternoon is to is to interest uh, uh, others in in visiting uh, historic sites uh, and settlements that dot the landscape of Ontario and North America. Uh, I'm certainly well versed on the settlements in the area of Essex and, and Kent County, and, and I'll just uh, enumerate uh, very briefly uh, as follows. In, in, uh, in Essex and Kent County, uh, these uh, terminals were, had names such as Anderton, Marble Village, Union, Gambia, Haiti Village, Breon, Don, Elgin, Dresden, Shrewsbury, Puce, Elmstead, Little River, Gosfield, Gesto, Gilgal, New Canaan, 
the Matthew Settlement, Edgar, Mount Pleasant, Rochester, Harrow, and the Refugee Home Society uh, where my ancestors uh, settled way back in the uh, early 1800s. Uh, but also uh, certainly a little further east, uh, we build, certainly we would be remiss not to mention St. Catharines, the Niagara Falls area, Queens Bush, not too far from, from Mississauga, uh, and, uh, and certainly Oro uh, near Owen Sound. And uh, I, I just mentioned but a few, a partial, partial li list, if you will. Uh, I coined the, the term, and I think all of the settlements would, would certainly fall into this category. I coined the phrase that the Underground Railroad was the first great freedom movement in the Americas. It was the first time that good people, black and white and of different races and face worked in harmony for freedom and for justice. And if they did it way back then, before Canada was really a country, we can do it today. Yes, I agree that, that we are living through some trying times. And so did our ancestors. The Underground Railroad Freedom Movement has a historical, spiritual, and even constitutional and immigration message for us and our children today. A message that uh, I smile and say is loaded with hope, encouragement, not division and hate. The Underground Railroad was a neutral history. It did not point fingers and it helped to uplift people. And, uh, and, and I know my, my ancestors uh, were, uh, the word has come down through generations uh, uh, from my aunt Stella Butler, who I'll talk about a little, in, a little later. Uh, she said that uh, John Freeman Walls and Jane King Walls told her that they, those who traveled on the Underground Railroad would literally run through the woods at night and hide by day. They would thirst for so much for freedom that they would even at times kneel down and drink rainwater, if you can imagine, out of the hoof prints of cattle in order to quench their thirst for freedom and continue along the perilous Underground Railroad to the heaven that they sang about in their songs, not heaven, heaven, that they sang about in their songs, namely the Northern Uni United States and even into Canada. At the entrance to the John Freeman Walls Historic Site and Underground Railroad Museum, there's a historic plaque that reads, in 1846, John Freeman Walls, a fugitive enslaved from North Carolina, built a log cabin on land purchased from the Refugee Home Society, an organization founded by the abolitionist Henry Bibb, publisher of The Voice of the Fugitive, and the famous Josiah Hansen. The cabin subsequently served as a terminal of the Underground Railroad and the first meeting place of the Pews Baptist Church. Although many former enslaved returned to the United States following the American Civil War, John and his family chose to remain in Canada. The story of their struggles forms the basis of the book, The Road That Led to Somewhere, which I was honored and proud and, 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 and blessed to, to write. Uh, and I couldn't have wrote the book if it wasn't for my Aunt Stella Butler. But I tangent just a moment and, 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 and just kind of come in for a, a, a little short uh, uh, oral pause re re related to the Refugee Home Society uh, that I just referred to in the historic plaque. And there were literally back in the 1800s, about 60 families uh, of uh, pioneer Canadians uh, freedom seekers who had literally made their way running through those woods, as I mentioned, and, and, and kneeling down and, and, and drinking rainwater in order to quench their thirst for freedom. And the first thing that they, they did when they came to Canada, uh, I'm proud to say, is they built churches. And in this Refugee Home Society uh, settlement, there were 
three churches. There was the uh, there was a Baptist church. There was the uh, the AME AME African Methodist Episcopal Church, and there was also a, a Zion Church, and I guess I I missed missed one the British Methodist Episcopal Church, because what would ha what happened is the AME the African Methodist Episcopal Church uh, the congregation were so excited, you know, so so caught up in in the importance of freedom and the the the, the taste of freedom that they felt that they uh, needed to form a, a church congregation, uh, which is still in existence today throughout, uh, throughout Canada, uh, and term it British, because they felt they'd be more protected under the British law in case slave catchers came across and wanted to take them back into uh, enslavement. Uh, they, my Aunt Stella and then my parents and also say that the enemy, which is the, the devil, always wants to take us back, you know, to where we came from when we were, we were in bondage. And uh, we had made it to Canada. Uh, we had freed our physical uh, bodies. And, uh, and through our churches, we uh, desire to spiritually uh, become free as, as uh, all uh, uh, congregations that, uh, that appreciate the fact that on Christ is solid rock we stand, all other ground is sinking sand. And uh, my Aunt Stella Butler, uh, I, I gave you a, a few uh, words from a, from a song uh, that, uh, that she would sing. But my Aunt Stella Butler, I take a moment to, to just uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, that deeper significance of my personal uh, family history through, through this lady. And Stella was the griot of our family. Uh, she was actually my cousin, but we all referred to her as Aunt Stella because she was uh, an elder, and and uh, and and she she wore that uh, uh, that 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 privilege and and, and that uh, 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 honor of being a griot uh, very proudly. Griot is a West African term for keeper of the oral history. And she told me and others stories of old time days, as she would say, uh, that became the pages of the book, The Road That Led to, to Somewhere. Uh, I, I, I remember when I was a, a young lad uh, and it, uh, my, my parents always taught me to, to uh, always treat people nice, but it wasn't hard treating my elders and uh, nice, and certainly Aunt Stella was one of them. And we'd be running through the house playing tag. And every time I came by Aunt Stella, I would stop and say, "Hello, Aunt Stella," and then she'd laugh and say, "That boy has manners." And I just I enjoyed the, you know being being patted on the head. So I come back and, and say it again. But it it uh, I, I say all that to say this. I remember sitting in my dental office one day. And her son Joey was in my one of my operating rooms, and and I went in and and he had tears running down his his cheek, and I said, Joey, what's what's wrong? She says, Oh, Brian. She says, she says, Ma sold the family home, said the strangers. I said, What? She says, Yeah, you know, Olive passed away. Olive would be my my grandmother and a good good friend of my aunt Stella. She passed away in September. And, and she said she doesn't think she wants to come back out in the country anymore. And, and she said all the families become city slickers and, and they don't, they're not interested in coming back out to the, to, to the country. And, uh, but she was really worried because on our property, we have a family cemetery. And I knew it was, it was churning inside of her that she didn't want to uh, really sell the land. And, uh, and, and fortunately, uh, without going into a half hour tangent, you know, I was, I'd say that uh, uh, she was very pleased to, to find out that I would be interested in, in purchasing it. And uh, she, I had to purchase it from strangers who would put in an offer and pay them a larger sum of money to, uh, to keep the family property, you know, in our, in our family's hands. And so Aunt Stella, uh, uh, cheered me on and, and supported me in this, uh, and I didn't want to have to go to court, uh, and so I uh, gladly uh, paid the extra amount of money 
to keep the pre the property. Uh, and I didn't realize that it would be such a blessing and allow me to be here today uh, speaking virtually, you know, to uh, uh, to wonderful people uh, uh, throughout uh, our great country called called Canada. Aunt Stella, uh, she was a unique lady. She didn't have a lot of book learning, but she was very wise. Uh, she do a lot of crossword puzzles, and uh, and and I recall. Uh, uh, that uh, um, a lawyer friend of mine, I went to school with him, Assumption High School in Windsor, and he went on to become a lawyer. And he said, Brian, he says, you're writing this book that, that Dan Stella's giving you genealogical research about and whatnot. You should, you should do a document of truth uh, to make certain that no one later on uh, questions the validity of, of what she's telling you. And uh, I said, oh, okay. So uh, Aunt Stella went before the, the, the lawyer, the private scenario, uh, so she wouldn't feel pressured by saying whatever maybe she felt I, I wanted her to say, uh, because we wrote it all down. And, and when she finished uh, her, her uh, declaration of truth, uh, she realized the lawyer was kind of questioning her because she was up in age. And she said, I got something else I'd like to say. And uh, when Robert Baxi, my lawyer friend, uh, said to me, she says, "You know what your your your, your aunt Stella did?" She said after he she had uh, 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 went through these the whole declaration of truth, she gave a five minute recitation of a poem that she had learned. She said in grade school, ladies and gentlemen, aunt Stella. I bought the property from her in 1976. She passed away in 1986 at 102 years of age. So she was 100 years old when she uh, recited that poem. And uh, if it wasn't for Aunt Stella, uh, I, I wouldn't be here now uh, singing her, her praises. I'd be singing her praises, but, but not in the way that I'm, that I'm, I'm doing today as a, a, a proud, uh, uh, recipient of the, the 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 Order of Canada and the Order of in, of Ontario, and so Aunt Stella was able to give to me the the the, the oral history of my family, and I said, "Wow, this is, this is really really interesting." And she went a little further, and she says, "Brian, she says I'd like you to even become the future grill, you know, and 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 you tell those younger ones that." Uh, what they need to, need to know. And, and I said, and, and you'd answer the question. She says, they'll, they'll ask you questions like, what was slavery all about? You know, and, and I said, well, and how would I answer that? And so Aunt Stella would go like this. And, and that, that, that meant it was about greed. And, and the things that certainly no, no, no race, creed, or color has a corner on the market of man's inhumanity demand. We all have, have sinned and fallen short, you know, as, as, as the minister would say. But she would let, let, let us know that. And, and she says, and make sure that future generations appreciate that they stand on the shoulders of great men and women who have gone before. You know, and make sure you let them them know because we're a multicultural family. You know, and 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 she says make make them know that that we're part of the the rainbow of humankind, and that we're John Freeman Walls and Jane King Walls descended, just as good as anyone. Just keep that 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 going from one generation to the other. Don't ever let yourself feel lesser than someone else because of the color of your skin you know, or, or, your, or your background, and then also get that, that good education. So Aunt Stella shared that with me. And, and I, I recall that uh, later on, I, 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 I uh, uh, made a lot of friends in, in the area of, of uh, historical uh, research and, and so on, and, and, and very, very uh, bright, intelligent uh, uh, descendants of a former enslaved, and I know up a good friend of mine up around the 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 uh, the, the Buxton area, the Algon Settlement area, by the name of uh, uh, the great Brian Prince, 
And I remember him calling me one time and, and I had uh, brought, did genealogical research and, and brought my, my story into the realm of, of not just oral history, but, but of, uh, excuse me, not, not just oral legend, but oral history. And so I had a number of, of great documents uh, that, uh, uh, that, that re would, would refute any claim that, that this was, uh, uh, the story was not only true, but unquestionably true. And Brian Prince called me one day and he says, I found some research, Brian, and I said, gotta share it with you because I know it was about your ancestors. And uh, uh, this gentleman that wrote the story uh, in the 1800s, was, his name was George Whipple. And he was the founder uh, of, uh, uh, well, actually he was, he kind of went through the, the Amistad. I won't go into details because that's not what I'm here to talk about today. Uh, but the Amistad uh, and Cinquay, uh, a story of the freeing of, of, of him and, and, and other enslaved. And, uh, and, and the evolution of the, the uh, Amistad uh, 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 story evolved into the American Missionary Association and, and George Whipple came up to Canada and uh, he had a, a, a day visit with, with your, your great, great grandfather, John Freeman Walls. And here's what he said to just till the soil uh, as I move forward. Tuesday, I returned to Little River, riding in a little cart drawn by a small French pony, guided by a Christian gentleman, but not of this church. He's a Baptist. His story is a little peculiar. As I mentioned in my opening statement, this story was a peculiar story. He is a very black man and was a slave in one of the Southern states. After the death of his old master, his mistress came north with her children, bringing this man with her. At length, she married him, and the whole family are now living happily together in Canada. He owns a little farm and is out of debt. And underscored that that's part uh, with an, almost like an asterisk that he was out of debt. There's an excellent school at Little River taught by a student from Oberlin, Ohio, a Mr. Wheeler. He might get a more advanced school and much better wages elsewhere, but is drawn here by his sympathy for an oppressed people. Drawn here by his sympathy for an oppressed people. Just want that to just sort of uh, turn in, 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 in your heart and in your mind uh, in, in terms of uh, making certain that our youth today get a good education and that they, they get a chance to, uh, uh, to, to talk to elders in their family, no matter what race, creed, or color, or nationality, because they, they can learn just as I learned that, uh, uh, that, that you, we, we truly stand on the shoulders of great men and women who have gone before. And Canada has a, has a, a lot of, uh, of great stories to tell. Not that my story is so uh, significant, but at the same time, uh, your own family story uh, could be featured uh, and, and used to, to encourage uh, your future uh, uh, generations to make the best of their, their talent. I recall Aunt, Aunt Stella taking me from, from the, the uh, uh, little beginning of, our, of the tour of the historic site to a family cemetery on the property. John Freeman Walls was so excited about having a, a place where he could be laid to rest into eternity. And it was beside a little, a little creek uh, called the, uh, the, uh, the Puce Creek. And uh, uh, this particular uh, cemetery, uh, which was uh, not, certainly not, not unusual, sometimes pioneers, they would, rather than going into the church cemetery, they, they, they would feel so proud of their land that they would put a little cemetery right beside it. And, and often 
I, I learned this when I was actually in South Carolina, just as a tourist. You know, often the enslaved uh, would would have their cemeteries, uh, which which is the case in in many of the cemeteries in the 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 Essex and in in Kent County area near a near a waterway, because the enslaved the newly arrived perhaps from Africa and then went through enslavement, made his way to freedom in Canada. Uh, they felt that the waterway would take their spirits back to their, their families. Uh, you know, they knew that this waterway, the Great Lakes uh, empties, I, I'm sure, into the, uh, the Great Atlantic Ocean and would take them back to Africa. And so I remember listening to Ann Stella talking to me about the, the, the cemetery and the the 40 some souls that were buried in, in, in there. And, uh, uh, and, and I, and I uh, have a opportunity now to, uh, uh, to pay a little tribute to a protagonist of my book uh, who lived in Toronto up your way uh, for 40 years. And it was his desire when he passed away uh, he, he passed away in 1996, actually 10 years after uh, Ann Stella passed away, and his name was Earl Walls. And for the younger ones out there who are uh, aspiring athletes and enjoy sports, uh, my uncle uh, Earl Walls was a former uh, Canadian heavyweight boxing champion. He was third contender in the world under the great Rocky Marciano. He had 36 uh, career victories. Uh, 32 of those uh, uh, career victories were in the first, were knockouts in the first round. Uh, he was, uh, he had rose to be third contender in the world under the great Rocky Marciano. Uh, he was champion of Canada between 1952 and 1956. And uh, he was a good friend actually, he helped to train uh, uh, George Chevallo, who many of you would, would certainly remember today, a great, a great man and, and uh, humanitarian and also uh, a great, great orator. I, I've had the opportunity to hear him speak and, and been inspired by him. And so uh, uh, my uncle's been in, inducted into uh, Boxing Hall of Fames in both Canada and in the United States. And that Stella, she didn't stop there. She 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 would uh, 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 give me some information about family members that I hadn't uh, met before, and certainly Jane King Walls uh, was was one of them. And uh, the the story she said about your ancestors, John Freeman Walls and Jane King Walls, is a, is a story where the truth of the story is stranger than fiction. You know, again, I bring up that word, it was a peculiar for the time because, and here's why, because John Freeman Walls was born in 1813. And on that same day, the slave master's son was born by the name of Daniel Walls. Unfortunately, Daniel Walls' mother died during childbirth. And, uh, and the slave master, his name was Eli, he uh, was very distraught by this. And uh, uh, I expand on what Aunt Stella shared with me in, in my book, but that, that's, that's for another time. The bottom line is, is that it was, it's, there's a lot of great uh, family research stories, but it's a story between John and Daniel and Jane King Walls that has uh, animated me and others and, and brought me here today. Because John Freeman Walls and Daniel Walls, uh, the slave master said to Jubal, which is my John Freeman Walls' mother, take care of Daniel. And, uh, and she did. She, she nursed the two children, one black and one white, as, as if they were her own, uh, well, there was, De John was, was her own child, but, but Daniel, she, she nursed him just as he, as a, as a brother to, to John. 
and uh, and they and they grew up uh, like boyhood friends, and 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 then they that 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 uh, division that was created by enslavement didn't affect them, you know. And she told she would, according to my aunt Stella, say to John and Daniel, "You you look out for each other. You have each as we say today in the vernacular way. You have each other's back. You know, you're you're like brothers. You know, you treat each other." kindly. And so uh, John and, and, and Daniel did that. They grew up. Uh, John married a lady from another plantation by the name of Sarah, plot thickens, and they had a couple children. Unfortunately, Sarah, her children uh, and herself, the, the, uh, the slave master ran into some financial uh, difficulty. And I think it was, it was gambling or something. And he had to sell some of his enslaved. And so he did. He sold Sarah and the, and the, the children of her and, 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 and John. John was on another plantation, so he couldn't protect them. And they were sold south before John was able to, to find out. And uh, uh, Daniel, uh, by this time, he was, they were both growed. And he married a lady by the name of Jane King and uh, who is Irish and Scottish. And, uh, and they looked as, as hard as they could to try to find Sarah, uh, even enlisted the help of Quaker abolitionists in Guilford County, uh, which is a, a county over from Rockingham County, North Carolina. Uh, and uh, they couldn't find Sarah. So uh, uh, as I, I, I move forward with my presentation, uh, I would just say this, that uh, uh, Daniel in his early 30s, he, he passed away uh, some some reason that Aunt Stella didn't know what it was probably. See, they always use the word the flux to describe why, why someone would, would die, could be cancer, could be whatever. But the bottom line, he, he passed away. But on his deathbed, he, he said to John and Jane, he said, John, I want you to take care of Jane and my children, they, they had four children, and I want you to take care of them and, and treat them as, as, as I would. Uh, John and, and, and Jane, uh, Jane was uh, an abolitionist-minded uh, individual, uh, um, even, even though she was a, 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 of Irish and Scottish descent, uh, she said to, 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 to John, you know, certainly, you know, uh, uh, as the Whipple letter indicated, uh, she uh, indicated that uh, they had, they had agape type love feelings for each other. Uh, they knew they couldn't stay in North Carolina during enslavement. So they took the children and a little uh, slave girl by the name of Corliss and made their way uh, in a clandestine way because they knew that the laws of the land wouldn't allow black and white to marry. Uh, they would they would have been their demise, and so they made their way to Indiana. And I remember Aunt Stella one day uh, when I, was, I took you know, many times to uh, I, I had interactions with her, and she took me over to the log cabin that uh, John and Jane had built on Four Rocks. And that log cabin later I'll I'll have uh, Matthew show you a picture of it because it's standing there proud and strong today. But the bottom line is, is that they uh, took him, took, she took me into the log cabin and she said, Brian, go up into the, the yes, there we go. Thank, thank you, Matthew. They went up into the log cabin because uh, it was two stories. You can't see the, the window from this angle. But the bottom line is, is she said, open that trunk and bring the letter down. And she did, I did. So I brought the letter down, and and the uh, the 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 the, the letter uh, was dated December the nineteenth, eighteen hundred and fifty four, uh, and on page one forty three of my book, and it reads as follows: December the nineteenth, eighteen fifty four. Respected members of this opportunity, friends, of writing a few words. We are all well. I've been been right smart of sickness these days. Two of our grandchildren die with the flux and that colored man died with the cholery and several more that came here to see thee. 
I wish you to write how you are satisfied. We have a boy boarding going to school and he wants to go to Canada, come to Canada someday. And we have had no account from you of late. Your well-wishing friend, Ephraim, your well-wishing friend, Mary Stout. And then underneath of it, almost like a uh, uh, asterisk to John and Jane Walls. I wish you to write to me soon and let me know how you are satisfied and how you are getting along, Ephraim Stout. So Ephraim and Mary Stout, a chill ran up my spine because I said to Ann Stella at that time, I said, Ann Stella, uh, you know what I'm saying? I said, this story is not just uh, uh, of interest to our own personal family, but I said, this could be interesting to our uh, expanded family of, 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 of Canadians of, of all race, creeds, and colors, you know? And she just, you know, shook her head and said, yep. And, and I said, uh, uh, these Quaker abolitionists, she said, yep, they were Quaker abolitionists in Indiana and they would send periodically enslaved up to Canada. And uh, if they made it to the, the, the walls, uh, law cabin and home, uh, they were to give, they knew they could get some, some, some hospitality and nourishment and, uh, and, and some, some spiritual uh, 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 food because that little log cabin uh, until the, the church was built down the road uh, in 1860 served as the first church of the refugee home society settlement uh, 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 for these 60 families. Now there certainly wouldn't be 60 families in that little house, but the point is they'd have church service there and uh, sing and pray and and, and sing Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, and coming for to carry me home. And I'm sure I'll throw a little Amazing Grace in there as well. You know, Amazing Grace you know, will always be my song of praise. And, uh, and the, the, the John Newton version, you know, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. You know, was blind, but now I see. And I'm trying to take any, any, type of, uh, of blinders from, from, from our eyes today, you know, and, and, and let people appreciate and understand, you know, that, that, that we as Canadians have much to be thankful for. You know, we, we, we have been, been left a legacy, you know, not of weapons of mass destruction, but a legacy that's even more powerful in terms of doing good, a, a legacy of mutual respect, of reconciliation, of leaving bitterness behind, you know, a legacy that is, is just as important today as it was in yesterday. It doesn't point fingers. It was good people, black and white of different races and faiths, working in harmony for freedom and for justice. And I can't help but, uh, uh, but, but tangent in, in terms of of uh, my, my, uh, my claim in the beginning to get into the deeper significance of what this Underground Railroad history is all about. Oh, there's other histories. I'm not trying to take away from, from them. You know, the, there's, you know we, could, we could tangent into the, 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 the Black porters on the trains and other things, you know, and the ways of immigration. But, but uh, I'm, I'm uh, not privileged to know as much about that as I do about the, the Underground Railroad, the first great freedom movement in the Americas, the first time good people, black and white of different races and faiths, worked in harmony for freedom and for justice. And I have to come in for a little, a little uh, slow down here and, 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 and share with you uh, the importance of a hero of mine, John Gray Simcoe. Now, John Gray Simcoe, in 1793, he was the first lieutenant governor of Upper Canada, as Ontario was called. He was a military man, you know, a, uh, a visionary. Uh, and I'm sure he was influenced by uh, by Wilberforce and 
and, and, and others. And, uh, and, and in 1793, in the first legislative assembly at Niagara on the lake in Navy Hall, he said these words, significant words. Why? Significance in terms of immigration and significant in terms of, of, of what would eventually become Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedom. He was the first individual, enslavement had gone on for 300 years, and he was the first individual in a country that was uh, under the, the, the umbrella of the great uh, uh, British Empire, but he was sent here to be the first Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada, as Ontario was called, Quebec was Lower Canada. And uh, he said these words, there should no longer be discrimination between those of European ancestry, those of native ancestry, and those of African ancestry. Sounds very simple. But the significance was, is that he was moved by a situation of a, a, in, uh, a lady, young lady by the name of Koi Cooley, who was living in, in the, the Niagara on the Lake area. And her, uh, she was an enslaved, there had been enslavement in Canada at the time. Nothing like it was in the Southern United States with King Cotton, economically speaking. He was more of a domestic type slave. And one day, uh, a gentleman by the name of Peter Martin uh, heard this yelling and screaming and here was Chloe Cooley uh, being carried across the, the Niagara River and being sold to a slave uh, master in the, in the United States. And, uh, and, and Peter Martin, uh, who eventually was, was part of the Butler's Rangers, told Simcoe. And Simcoe, because he, he knew Simcoe had a, an, an abolitionist spirit. He had a spirit of of, of love, of joy, of peace, of patience, of kindness, of gentleness, and self-control against which there is no argument. He had that kind of, kind of leadership experience. That's why he's a great man today. Even though we, we need to, 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 to learn more about him and others uh, in, in, our, in, our, in our schools uh, today. But he said in the first legislative assembly at Niagara-on-the-Lake, despite the fact that some of his members of government uh, owned slaves in Canada, he said that there should no longer be enslavement. There should no longer be discrimination between those of African ancestry, European and African ancestry. He was true to this, his word. It was a compromise legislation, as I mentioned. However, you know, it was the the first big blow, you know, against uh, slavery. And that, and that thought uh, continued to grow and, uh, and, and it touched the hearts and minds of the, uh, of, of the mother country. And in 1833, uh, uh, enslavement was abolished throughout the British Empire. It came into effect in 1834. And as a result of, of what uh, our own John Gray Simcoe did way back in the old time days as Aunt Stella would, would mention. And the Underground Railroad, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, in the early part of the 1700s uh, came into effect uh, because of uh, Quaker abolitionist leaders like Levi Coffin, you know, who, uh, who, who they, the, the Quakers and, and there's other religious sects as well, but the Quakers were very effective in, in terms of, of helping, as I mentioned earlier, my ancestors and others uh, to, to freedom. And as a result of that, uh, you know, it, it's been a, and I've been able to, 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 to break historical bread with you. And, uh, and, and as I, as I kind of hurry to a, 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 a close, However, I, I'm, I want to share with you 
uh, as I mentioned earlier, that deeper significance of what the Underground Railroad uh, means to me and, and means to, 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 to my, my fight, my wife rather, uh, Anna, uh, today. You know, as we uh, 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 transition our historic site uh, into future generations so that your children and their children's children can come and, 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 and enjoy not only the, the Refugee Home Society settlement, uh, more specifically the John Freeman Walls Historic Site and Underground Railroad Museum, but, but settlements up near where you're at uh, as well. You know, and, and also pay, pay respect to the, 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 the First Nation uh, uh, ancestry. If I had time, but that's where the book comes in, you know, I could tell you that uh, uh, one of the firstborn um, male children of John and Jane was my, my great grandfather uh, by the name of Henry Walls. And he married a uh, First Nation uh, lady. And, uh, and so as a result of that, you know, I'm sitting here proud to, to, to be a Heinz 57 combination of, of, of John and Jane, Irish and Scottish and, and John being half African. And I'm proud of my black ancestry. You know, also proud of the fact that I have Aboriginal ancestry uh, through the marriage of, of Henry to, uh, uh, to, to Parthena, who was of First Nation ancestry. And, and that came down through the, 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 the Brantford uh, area and uh, uh, where the, through the great, um, you know, the great settlement of uh, was started. You know, back by the by the great Tecumseh, and uh, uh, my my ancestry through the the First Nation is uh, uh, like the, my ancestry through John and Daniel and, and and Jane. You know, where the the truth of the story is is at times stranger than than fiction, but one of the truths of the of the story is is. Uh, exemplified for me when I was researching and uh, writing some articles for for PBS. I, I, I taught as a, a adjunct and a visiting professor at Niagara University, Niagara Falls, New York, right near New Lewiston, found in 1856 by the Vicentian Fathers of the, of the Order of St. Vincent de Paul. Wonderful people, wonderful school. Uh, you know, all multicultural school, uh, even though it, was, it has the roots in, in the Catholic faith. And I, and I know in my heart that the, that, that the, the Catholics uh, had to help uh, enslaved when they were making their way from, uh, uh, from the Buffalo area and whatnot and crossing the, and, and Niagara Falls. Uh, and I, I know that to, to, to be the case. But the, the, the bottom line is, is that uh, uh, the, the importance of freedom is, is something that we all have a, uh, 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 a desire to, to, uh, to live in freedom and live in, in harmony with our friends and, and neighbors. And I'm going to share a little bit of, of a re research that I, I had come across when I was doing my research and it was about Thomas Jefferson. And it went something as follows. Thomas Jefferson explained in the late 1700s how important it was to have a prodigy mentality and firmly fight for the abolishment of slavery. Jefferson felt that slavery did more than take away liberty from the slave. It also had negative effects on the slave master and his children from one generation to the next. In the late 1700s, Jefferson explained, expanded rather on his view that parents, particularly slave masters, should be positive mentors to their children. Although Jefferson owned slaves, he expressed the importance of slave masters showing kindness to the enslaved, especially in front of the, their children. He wrote the following. 
The whole commerce between master and slave is a perpetual exercise of the most boisterous passions, the most unremitting depotism, and on the one part in degrading submissions on the other. Our children see this, Jefferson wrote, and learn to imitate it. For man is an imitative animal. This quality is the germ of all education in him. From his cradle to the grave, he is learning to do what he sees others do. If a parent could find no motive, either in his philanthropy or his self-love for restraining his intemperance of passions towards his slave, it should always be the sufficient one that his child is present, but generally it's not, not sufficient. The parent storms, the child looks on, catches the liniments of wrath, put on, puts on the same airs in the front of little slaves, gives its worst passions, and thus nursed, educated, and daily exercise in tyranny cannot be stamped out. The man must be a prodigy who can retain his masters and morals undepraved by such circumstances. Jefferson's words echoed what abolitionists and sympathizers of the Underground Railroad Freedom Movement felt in the 1900s. And I share a, a image with you that uh, my, my wife is a great photographer, retired nurse, and I, I think a picture's worth a thousand words. And we use this image because it sort of inspired us because of the, the, the story that Ann Stella had shared about John and Daniel. And that story of mutual respect and reconciliation and leaving bitterness behind is just as important today as it was in yesterday. And I can honestly say as I again hurry to a close that we have much to be thankful for, but the devil would like to make us feel that we don't. When in essence, all we have to do is remind ourselves of what our ancestors went through and know that they laid a foundation that we can build on. And that is what progress is all about. That is what progress is all about. I had one of the wonderful experiences that uh, in, in my life, and, and I know my wife can agree, is for 14 years, Mrs. Rosa Parks, the icon and, and mother of the civil rights movement in the United States would come to the historic site bringing students who she was training in the philosophy of Dr. Martin Luther King, peaceful nonviolence for change. And when they would come in and they tour the historic site, and as I mentioned to you, I wanted to go into the deeper significance of the site, uh, if nothing else. You know, facts and figures have their place and 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 and, and now we want to take away from that as a historian. However, when these children would come through busloads of them, you know, sometimes even children at risk, you know, of, of going the, the, the wrong, in the wrong direction in life. And we would ask them a question and, and the question would be, well, what do you think about this Underground Railroad history? And uh, uh, what we would say to the, the, the student is, uh, uh, the students would say, well, what does this old time day stuff have to do with me today? You know, I'm, I'm free, I'm, I'm not a slave. And, uh, and then I remember smiling and looking over at Mrs. Rosa Parks and she smiled and I said, well, are there any modern day enslavers? And all of a sudden, maybe 50 of students who were, the busloads would, would often have 50 students, uh, you know, in, in, in the, on the bus. And one little hand would go up and say, well, modern day enslaver? And they'd say, drugs. Yeah, that could be a modern day enslaver. Poor self-esteem would come up another time. If you don't love yourself, how in the world are you gonna love me? You know, uh, 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 hatred, violence, you know, all of these things would, would start to, to make the, the student appreciate the fact 
this story of the Underground Railroad has a message for us today. And, and the immigration policy that we have in Canada today can literally be traced back to the Coley, Cooey, and the John Gray Simcoe uh, legislation of 1793 and the importance of equality. You know, they, the, the enslaved would be told, we hear a lot about, uh, you know, tell the truth, tell the truth, tell the truth. Well, the, the enslaved would down the south would be told that the Detroit River was 4,000 miles wide, 4,000 miles wide. And if they made it to Canada, the crows would pick their eyes up. They didn't have digital uh, uh, iPhones and, and uh, whatnot, and, and, and the newspapers weren't, weren't uh, blurting things out to them. You couldn't read. You know, but unfortunately, we, we have to tell the story and tell it in a true way so that Canada can truly have that motto of there's a Durante's Valorian page, we desire a better country, and we can radiate out up to the rest of the world today. Enough is enough. Just as John Gray Simcoe said, you know, and then then I was so proud of the, the, getting to know personally through my uncle Earl Walls and my dad Clifford, the great uh, uh, Sir Lincoln, the great Lincoln Alexander, you know, uh, former governor, first black governor of of of, of Ontario, you know, and uh, a lawyer and, and 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 a member of Parliament. You know, and I think that at the OPP headquarters in Aurelia, they have a building built in his honor. You know, and so we've just got a lot of, of great reasons as Canadians to say enough is enough. You know, and, and, I, and I'm going to, gonna, for, for certain, close now my formal presentation uh, by saying the following. Uh, I don't, I, there's no saying about democracy. Democracy may not be the best form of government, but show me a better, but show me a better. You know, I'm not privileged to talk about and talk for all blacks in Canada. I understand that. I've heard the great Lincoln Alexander say that himself. He's not privileged, but we agreed on one thing for sure, is that Canada may have some problems in terms of race relations and other relations and 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 some of this nonsense of of, of mistruths that's swirling around, you know, and and, and changing people's way of thinking and into uh, uh, making them, you know, not appreciate the greatness of this great country. But I will say this much: that Canada may have some problems in terms of systemic racism. But as a direct descendant of a traveler on the Underground Railroad who made it with his wife, Jane King Walls, to freedom, that there's no better country in the world for a visible minority to live than in Canada. And I thank you all very much for the time that you allowed me to speak to you, however, briefly. God bless you. Well, I, I don't know if there's a finer point to, to end a conversation on, to be honest, that is, uh, a wonderful message to send and that, you know, I encourage anyone and um, I have, I have a promise to you that I will come and see your site, but, uh, uh, and, and visit with you, but, but also just to anyone down in that area, as things open up and, you know, spring turns to summer, uh, come and go for a drive. It's not far off the 401 down in the, in the Windsor area. Uh, have a visit to the John Freeman Wells uh, Historic Site and Underground Railway Museum. But also you, you, you have several partner organizations nearby. We should do a, a hat tip out to, uh, to Stephen Cook and Uncle Tom's Cabin National Historic Site who, uh, who uh, connected me to you. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, neighbors aren't that far wonderful away. Wonderful man, wonderful man, Stephen. Yes, yes, yes. But, but neighbors aren't that far away. Way. There's lots to see and lots to visit if you want to explore the stories of the Underground Railroad down in the Windsor area, um, but stories elsewhere, some closer to home, and you've highlighted some of those. And uh, I, I do want to uh, uh, draw uh, attention, if you will, to your book, um, The Road That Led to Somewhere. Uh, and this book is available through, uh, through, uh, through the website. 
Uh, you can yes. visit uh, www.undergroundrailroadmuseum.org um, and uh, and uh, not only check out the website but also the uh, the shop section, which will contain a link to to purchasing your book. Um, and uh, just I know you've touched on the surface of a much larger story yeah. and uh, uh, much larger stories that you have to tell yeah. and uh, yeah. uh, hopefully we'll have a chance to explore some in the future and uh, I, I wish you all the success I wish you um, uh, good weather good reopening whenever that happens um, and uh, and uh, a, a, a promising future for the for the museum even as we look forward and or look backwards onto the story of how it came to be so um, Dr. Wells, uh, Dr. Wells, thank you so much for, for joining us, for sharing with, with us and uh, um, the, the, the road that led to somewhere <laughs> is, uh, is, you, is, is quite you. a story. Yes, um, and, and again, thank you so very much. Thank you for joining us today for our final webinar in our four-part series, Black Heritage Matters. We would like to thank Dr. Brian Walls for sharing the stories of his ancestors and showing how we, as a collective and inclusive community, can achieve greater things together. It is through understanding the truth of our history in its entirety that we can build connections, understanding, and allyship for our diverse communities in Mississauga. Heritage Mississauga would also like to thank the Community Foundation of Mississauga and the City of Mississauga for their financial support to help us to continue to bring educational programs and resources, such as this webinar series, to our followers. Heritage Mississauga has been honored to bring our Black Heritage Matters webinar series to our communities during Black Heritage Month. We believe that continuing to bring these stories and presentations to our followers will serve to create a greater appreciation and awareness for the contributions Black Canadians have made in the past in the present and into the future of our country. Please stay tuned for more programs in the upcoming months. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our social media, YouTube and podcast channels to stay up to date on all of Heritage Mississauga's programs and events. <laughs>